2017 wildfires and who have been leading the charge in the recovery. I remember being at an event this summer where Supervisor Susan Gorn spoke, wearing a lovely red dress. She said to the audience, I have new clothes. <laughs> now we all know that this remark was not made because Susan is a clothes horse shopper. She said it because she herself, like some of you in the audience, lost everything. Since then, she has been busy not only recovering herself, but helping all of those in Sonoma County recover, including the preparation of the five-year Sonoma County Fire Recovering Plan, now underway by the new Office of Recovery and Resiliency. Mayor Madeline Agramonte, among her other duties, represents the City of Sonoma and the Regional Climate Protection Authority while the city of Sonoma was fortunate to escape direct damage from the 2017 fires, Mayor Agramonte worked tirelessly to provide emergency shelters and now supports connecting the Sonoma Valley community to resources for recovery and the best places to access update information as well as the Love in the Air Community Gratitude Project. Fire Chief Steve Acker, a lifelong Sonoma resident with over 30 years of fire service experience, told the Sonoma son, who called him a hero, that his crews on the line were the real heroes who never could have imagined four different fires at the same time. And each one by itself was a major incident. In his words, it was truly daunting. Please stay after the speakers for a cue and answer with some of Steve's heroes. Please give, help me give a big welcome to Susan and Steve, and we'll welcome Madeline when she arrives. This is my pleasure and my honor uh, to actually talk and be with you uh, because when I'm, uh, I'm a person who tends not to, uh, and I recognize so many of you as fire survivors like me, and folks in the community who are, who work so hard to comfort and provide uh, assistance to the fire survivors. Uh, as, as a supervisor, I am talking with other supervisors and commissioners across the nation, and my very first <laughs> message is, please reach out and take, well, please check your personal home insurance coverage and then and encourage all of your constituents to do that. But please work with your communities to be prepared for some kind of natural disaster, whether it's an earthquake or a hurricane or a tornado or, uh, heaven forbid, we have more wildfires. But as you know, I'm on a personal one-woman mission to rid the earth of juniper bushes. <laughs> <laughs> I fortunately was not in my home during the traumatic night of the firestorms, uh, and I lost my home two nights later when the fires, the wind shifted, uh, the fires came through Trioni Annandale State Park, and I was back in town at that point, but I never knew that the fires were coming to my idyllic heaven, my place on earth, the place that I commune with nature, pick up a shovel to pound the heck out of the rocks and the soil when I'm angry at whatever, whomever. And, uh, and so, yes, when Senator Mike McGuire was uh, patrolling the, the roads of Oakmont and he said, Gordon, you have flames all around your house. I'm gonna break a window, what do you want? And I said, don't break a window, here's the code, get this, 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 this. <laughs> I was so fortunate that I did have people there at the time uh, to retrieve a few things that were important in our lives, my husband and my life. He got his bike, he got his computer, his music tablet. I got my rescue jewelry, some of it, not all of it, and, um, and I, I loved how you opened it up that uh, people 
don't know that I actually am a clothes horse. I love clothes. <laughs> <laughs> so I told Mike, I said, I'm coming home from Colorado. I have flannel shirts and jeans. Go into my closet, get a couple of jackets, because I have nothing to wear. And so typical Mike, he walks into my walk-in closet and he says, Shit, Goran, how many clothes do you have? <laughs> well, I have many fewer jackets at the moment, but um, a, a color, color, new, new, so it is a painful way to update your wardrobe. But I'm also fortunate in that uh, there were only two homes lost in Oakland. And unusually, I have a large lot. I sit on an old uh, adjacent to the state park, and I can see that beautiful, now slightly scorched view of Hood Mountain. And it's my place of ref refuge to watch the birds circling and the deer, and we've seen some cats in our yard. Um, and also, fortunately, we grazed, uh, we hired sheep on our hillside for our sub-association. Our hillsides did not burn. And jokingly, I say, had I known, I would have gone up to my house and thrown everything out on the hillside to save it. Uh, but, but that's the lesson learned. There were so many lessons that we learned. Uh, vegetation management is so important. And I, I, I was telling Mimi, every public meeting that I uh, tend to participate in in Sonoma has like five people there. So, wow, this is great. Thank you all for coming. And it, and it indicates to me that, first of all, you were concerned about fire safety, vegetation management, and that you, like me, are one with the earth. And you have a passion for growing things. And hopefully we will learn today what kind of things are appropriate for growing in our environment and how to create or recreate defensible space. I had heard from, I think, someone here. She had someone come up and evaluate. And Cal Fire said, oh, you're good. She expected them to say, oh, you need to cut down this and this and this. And I think that's where the agencies need to connect with the communities when we are out there helping neighborhoods understand how to create defensible space. It's probably not appropriate to say, oh, you're good, when in fact they do have a vegetation around the house. And so, Mimi, we have some work ahead of us. We do. And thank you so much for organizing this. I really thank all of you. You are going to be the prophets out there talking with your friends and neighbors and direct them to the resources. And we will probably have some more of these workshops. So we will continue to have you and so many other folks coming to learn about how we can help prepare ourselves. Thank you so much. Wow, that's a, that's a tough act to follow. But um, I really want to echo um, how wonderful this is to see so many people with this level of interest, um, you know, on a beautiful Saturday morning to spend half of a day here learning about how we can we can get better, right? And we can do better. Um, this is, uh, this is a great opportunity for everybody here to learn about how what they can do to empower yourselves to take an active role in defending your property, what's important to you. Um, and do it in a, in a really collaborative way with nature. Um, so I'm very happy, um, very honored to be here and that I was asked to speak. Um, gosh, there's there's so much that, that I, I feel like this is an amazing opportunity to have so many of you here with this subject in mind that I could probably talk for a couple hours myself, but I know I'm not allowed. So um, there's, a, there's just a couple of things that I wanna highlight on this. Um, first of all, um, I appreciate it, the very warm and very nice welcome from Joanna. Um, you know, this is my hometown. Um, I'm absolutely honored to serve the community and our organization in the capacity that I do. Um, there's no place that I'd rather be. Uh, but at the same time that you know, we all went through this event as a community, and it was difficult for me. But I know it's difficult for a lot of others who lost their homes and were evacuated for a long period of time. Um, but we couldn't have done it as first responders, as firefighters, without the community's support. And so, again, I want to thank all of you in the community that looked out for each other as neighbors, looked out for us, supported us, because we couldn't have done it without you. So thank you. 
Um, so a couple of couple of big things I want to talk about, um, and it's why we're here, right? We want to get better. We want to do better. Um, there's a lot of lessons learned from the experience that we went through in October. Um, we learned about you know the need to improve warning systems, the need to improve response and staffing, the need to improve our outreach to the public and, and educating the public on defensible space, fire prevention, emergency preparedness. Um, and, I, and I want to assure you that the fire service leadership, not only here in the valley, but in the county, is, is really taking um, very meaningful steps and efforts to improve in all of those areas. Um, we have the full support of not only our first district supervisor here, but board of supervisors we've come up with we've developed a countywide plan for improving fire service delivery throughout the county um, as a supervisor mentioned the um, defensible space vegetation management is a really important component the county has set aside some one-time funds for us to and we're our fire districts here in the valley are working collaboratively with the county to address vegetation management um, we've also been able to come up very quickly with a program to increase staffing. Thanks again to the county and some one-time funding um, when we have the extreme weather events, the red flag warnings. Um, your fire service is adding additional staffing during those times to be proactive. Um, we hope that we don't need them in, during those events, but when we do, they're there and we have additional capacity because that was one of the things that we saw in October, because of the number of incidents, we couldn't be everywhere. Um, so a couple of things, a um, couple of additional things. Uh, this is wonderful. Defensible space, firewise gardening is a really important part of defensible space. Um, we know that defensible space makes a difference in the home survivability. Um, so I can't, I can't emphasize enough how important this subject is to everyone. Um, we do work collaboratively with CAL FIRE and the districts to try to get information out there about defensible space and how to defend your homes. Um, there's uh, been a lot of interest within various parts of the community, especially those areas that are most at risk, most vulnerable for wildfire. Um, Maya Comas, um, anybody lives up in the Mayacamas area, um, Trinity Cavedale, um, just started a fire safe council. Um, and that's a really important group that, uh, that will help to prepare the community both in, in a lot of different ways, both in defensible space, um, as well as um, being able to notify and take care of each other. Um, so, and, and have the ability as a fire safe council to see grant and other funding to be able to work on some of these maybe bigger projects within that area um, more than just over and above just what an individual homeowner can do. And I know some of those conversations are happening in the Glen Ellen community um, as well as Mission Highlands and um, Diamond A. So if you live in any of those areas, have interest, um, fire safe councils is another way that we can as, as a community as a smaller segments of our community get together and improve. Um, last thing, uh, two last things that I want to talk about um, very briefly is um, again on the subject of how we get better and how we are more prepared in the future. Um, you're you're going to see, or if you haven't already, you're going to see some big red signs out in the community. Yes on X, yes on Y, and yes on T. That's a very collaborative effort among the fire districts here in the Valley. Um, we've recognized we don't have enough staffing to be able to provide the level of service that we need here in the Valley. And it's our way of trying to ask the community if you're willing to support additional staffing on the engine companies, as well as programs. We also recognize that we have not had the to get out and do as much defensible space public education programs that we need to be able to do. We do what we can with engine staffing, but as with a lot of industries, programs need staff to be 
successful, and so we recognize that. So um, I just want to mention that, that that's out there if you need more information. Um, and this goes into my last point. Um, we are going to have an engine crew here from Sonoma Valley. Um, they will be here at about 12.30. They will be here and be able to talk about our um, emergency preparedness program. Um, some of you may know it's called the SCOPE program. Um, they will have some information. We also have a lot of information on our website, um, that including the full program. Uh, they'll also be able to, um, the Q&A is a part of, of the program right now initially, but they'll be able to uh, answer and field a bunch of questions that you may have regarding defensible space, um, community preparedness, individual preparedness um, near the close of the program. So um, thank you all again so much. Um, this, is, this is really quite a testament to our community and our, um, and our commitment to do better and um, be as prepared as we can. So thank you. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. And um, I'd like to echo, thank you so much for coming out so bright and early on a beautiful Saturday morning. This is what we're going to be covering today. And the intent of my presentation is really to try to set the framework for all the other presentations today. Um, and Susan and Chief Higgers did such a beautiful job of setting the context for us. We're really hoping to give you a sense today of how to make your home landscape more firewise. So uh, I'm going to start with some framework. Uh, and then um, we're going to move into discussing rebuilding soil after fire. Uh, and then uh, landscape design for dispensable space and maintenance and water use in a firewise garden. And I want to just step back for a minute. So uh, at the end of last October, um, we really came together as, an, as a program, um, the UC Master Gardener program here in Sonoma County, to say what can we be doing to help our community recover and rebuild and be better prepared for the future. So we've basically, I pulled together a team um, of about 15 of our master gardeners. Um, all of the speakers today um, and a number of the other master gardeners here were part of that team to do a deep dive into all the content that's out there about um, firewise and fire safe landscaping. And there's a lot of material. <laughs> uh, we're really just surfacing after um, nine, ten months doing a deep dive into that and really trying to filter out the content that we felt was most relevant from a home landscaping perspective. So this workshop and um, all the content you'll see on our webpage is a reflection of that nine months uh, deep dive that we did. Okay, so the elephant in the room. Um, certainly an event that was a serious wake-up call for many of us. I, I was speaking with uh, we have a master gardener who's joined us who drove over from Lake County um, this morning to join our presentation this morning. Um, and um, I asked her if it was insensitive for me to say, but in some conversations with a fire official, um, we've talked about Lake County being the canary in the coal mine. Um, and I, I heard a statistic recently that um, two thirds of the land in Lake County has burned in the last series of years. Um, and I'm going to talk in my presentation about um, climate, I'm trying to stay away from climate change. Um, I'll talk about that a little later. Um, but uh, I think, I don't think anyone in this room <laughs> um, uh, needs an explanation. I think everybody comes to the table understanding that we all need to be doing better individually to be preparing for this in the future. So, um, as Chief Akers, I'm sure, could do probably a two-hour presentation on. Um, wildfire protection in, um, and firefighting in California is a very complex landscape. <laughs> um, and um, I grabbed a couple slides that show, uh, has, has everybody heard of the SRA and the LRA? I'm not going to dive really deep into it. Um, but um, there's I basically why I pulled these maps was because, and, and Chief Baker could do a deep dive into that. Um, because they show um, very high fire severity zones um, in, uh, in Sonoma County specifically. In local responsibility areas, wildfire protection is the responsibility of either the state, local government, or federal government. And local responsibility areas include incorporated cities and cultivated agricultural lands. And typically, fire protection is provided by city fire departments, fire protection districts, counties, and by CAL FIRE under contract to your local government. Um, 
I will say, get to know your local fire agency. They're lovely people and important to have as friends. And um, you can, as, as, um, uh, as they mentioned, have someone come out and inspect your property and highly advise you um, getting to know who your local fire agency is. This map shows the state responsibility area, which is the area um, of where the state of California is financially responsible for the prevention and suppression of wildfires. Um, and SRA does not include lands within the city boundaries or in federal ownership. And for example, I, uh, I don't know if my pointer is working this morning. I'm up here in this far northeastern uh, part of the county where it's nice and dark red. So um, I'm certainly paying attention as we all need to. But the reality is, is that wildfire is a very important part of our ecology here in the state of California. Uh, in fact, 50% of the ecosystems are fire dependent and the balance are mostly fire adaptive. So it is a natural part of our environment and provides a very important uh, ecological function. Okay, so I'm gonna step back just a minute. So um, the foundation of everything that underlies the educational outreach that we do as UC Master Gardeners here in Sonoma County um, is to um, promote sustainable landscape practices. And I wanted to just to give you a, a brief touch on what that means. It's about selecting the right plant in the right place, uh, protecting and encouraging wildlife, incorporating integrated pest management techniques, nurturing the soil, which we're gonna hear a lot more about in our next presentation, conserving energy, protecting water quality, and conserving water. So the reality is, this framework absolutely still applies in a firewise landscape. Um, we need to choose plants that perform well in our climate and our microclimates. We need to nurture the soil, group our plants by water needs, irrigate and maintain them appropriately, and healthy plants that support wildlife and that are planted in the right place um, will be more fire resistant than plants that are struggling to survive. And this just lists some of the reasons of um, why sustainable landscape practices are so important in our home gardens. Um, certainly, um, sustaining water quality availability um, is incredibly important. Reducing offsite water movement in, out, out of the storm drains, keeping it retained on our home properties, uh, reducing energy use, composting, nurturing the soil, all very important topics. Um, so just wanted to set the framework that that's one of the components of the key component of what we're educating our community about. I want to do this with sensitivity because there's an incredible opportunity for us post fires to be making our landscapes not just more um, fire wise but more sustainable. Um, but I do it with sensitivity to those of you who are rebuilding post fire. Um, those of us who did not lose our homes really can have no concept of what you're going through and the financial pressures and difficulties. But there is an opportunity for us to introduce more sustainable practices, and we're just trying to help clue you into some of the opportunities that you might want to keep in mind as you're moving forward with your rebuild. So this actually shows a map of um, Coffee Park area. Um, and if you're not familiar with the County of Sonoma LIDAR, this is one of the maps that's generated out of the County of Sonoma LIDAR, um, which shows these are basically showing impermeable surfaces in this um, neighborhood alone. So all those dark blue and red areas are all impermeable surfaces. Um, so it's an example of the potential opportunity we have to increase the landscape sustainability of our neighborhoods, in this case in regards to water retention in the soil. And here's another map from Coffee Park that shows tree cover. And trees, um, though they need to be properly placed from a firewise landscaping perspective, um, have great opportunity for energy conservation in our homes. So um, just lots of opportunities for us to rethink as we're rebuilding our landscapes or rehabilitating our existing ones. We are seeing increase in summer temperature trends. In 2017, um, the average summer temperature was 73.7, which was an upward trend. And hotter temperatures mean a higher evapotranspiration rate. I'm not gonna dive into that. That's a, a deep topic, but that's basically the water that's lost from the soil and the plants. And that also means uh, low, lower soil water bank. And seasonal drying of vegetation is associated with higher fire risk. 
We're certainly seeing a lot of variation in the rainfall trends and the rainfall patterns. Um, I will point out that we had a particularly dry uh, summer in 2017. You see some other spikes with rain in May through July and then starting up as early in August. What's complicated is um, there's a lot of modeling going on around climate change and whether that means more rain or less rain. Um, and different models say different things. So while we don't know what's in our future from a rainfall perspective, um, we can look at what some historical trends have been. Okay, I mentioned earlier that I'm um, originally, when I started setting up this presentation with my fellow presenters, we talked about the importance of talking about climate change and the potential for increased wildfire. Um, and as we started diving into that topic, also incredibly complex. Same kind of challenge. There's a lot of modeling out there that, that indicates different things, that predicts different things. But I did take this quote um, from a recent scientific study um, that says, um, maybe we can make a direct correlation between climate change and increased wildfire. Um, certainly models for projecting rainfall, as I mentioned, are showing great variability. Um, but there obviously may be some direct impact. Okay. So, uh, the presence and characteristics of wildfires are determined by both biophysical and anthropogenic or man-driven uh, factors. And from a um, biophysical perspective, um, uh, it's based on temperature, moisture, wind, and vegetation. And the anthropogenic factors are associated with ignitions, uh, development at the wildland urban interface, which is very important for us, and wildfire uh, suppression activities. And modelers are still looking, working to determine how Santa Ana sundown, Sundowner and Diablo winds may uh, respond to climate change as well. So we're seeing the same kind of model variability about what may change with winds. But I, for example, who had never heard of Diablo winds before last October? Just me? I mean, I heard the Santa Anas, but I'd never heard of the Diablos, and I was like, what is this strange new thing? And uh, anybody else um, uh, disturbed by the wind now? <laughs> it was windy up at my house last night, and that's, you know, it's not comforting. Oh, let's just say that. Okay, so um, what is the WUI, and why is it important? Uh, the, the wildland urban interface is the area where urban and suburban development meets undeveloped areas containing natural vegetation. And why it's important is because there's been a 72% population increase in Wui areas since the 1960s. So there's a lot more of us living in the Wui than there was 50 years ago. So back to October 2017. And I stole this slide from Carolyn Safford of Fire Safe Sonoma, um, who we've been spending a lot of time with lately, having lots of conversations. She's a wonderful resource, though she's been stretched a little thin since last October. It's, it's putting it mildly. Um, so um, from Care Leon, uh, and I thought she said it so well, I just stole this up slide directly. There were things we were worried about that happened. There were things we didn't think would happen that happened. Homes with all of the right stuff burned, and homes with none of the right stuff survived, right? So there's no guarantee. However, um, the information we're presenting is firmly based in scientific research. The principles are valid. There is no such thing as a fireproof buoy home, especially in extreme conditions, such as we saw last October. But it is well worth the time, expense, and effort to follow these principles. And we certainly hope that you can move forward with some good tools and ideas for a more fire-adapted home. Also from Care Leon, um, our individual action is key. So um, Chief Aker talked about all the wonderful resources that the county is trying to put towards firefighting, um, but our indiv individual actions are incredibly important for us to be better prepared in the future. So there's more fire than there are firefighters, and your work can be one of the most effective defenses for your home. So what can we do? This is actually a gentleman named Jeff Cohen, who's recently retired from the US Forest Service, very esteemed, apparently, in the firefighting community. So during wildfires, home ignition is primarily related to vulnerabilities on the structure itself, fuels um, within 100 feet of your home, and weather. 
And it's important that we understand the basics of fire. The basic equation is fuel plus oxygen plus heat equals fire. But which of these three can we control? Fuel. Um, but fuel is anything, <laughs> basically. Um, dry or dead vegetation, wood siding, roofing, and fencing, trees, woody shrubs or perennials, and mulch. One of the most popular questions we've gotten since the fire is, can you give me a fire, fire resistant plant list? <laughs> there is no such thing. And there are a lot of resources out there, and trust me, we've combed through all of them. And I've had some very heated and intense conversations with some University of California resources. One of the most important, there's a couple of really key messages we want to send you home with today. Um, any plant will burn. And I love that Susan's on her mission against juniper, that is known as the gasoline plant. And hers happened to be an old, large hedge directly abutting a wooden deck directly abutting her house. Um, not a good combination. Um, uh, when I had that conversation with her, I don't know, it must have been March or April. It, it, it really, it rang home. Um, but any plant will burn. Um, so uh, we don't have a fire resistant plant list. We're, we're working towards maybe some recommendations in that regard. But the most important thing you can do is defensible space and maintenance, 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 maintenance. And we're going to talk to you about some more about that today. Okay. So fire can spread through either direct flame or radiant heat. And you can see what an impact um, that uh, defensible space can have in that regard. Um, but embers born on wind can be a uh, more significant um, spread of fire. And we certainly saw that last October. Another keystone message we're sending you home with today. Start with the house and work out. You've got to harden your home structure. Truly one of the most important messages we're gonna give you today. I will say, however, we are the master gardeners. So we're not gonna to talk to you today about how to harden your home, but there's tons of great resources that we've identified to help you in that regard. In fact, there's a great poster in the back uh, that's from the Insurance Institute of Fire Safety, I think I'm getting that name right, um, that talks about home hardening. Um, we've got those in your individual packets, uh, and we've got some um, UC resources, some publications to point you to in that regard as well. So our two guiding principles to help prevent wildfire home ignitions are to harden our structures, to resist ignition, and to decrease the surrounding vegetation. Uh, another great slide stolen from Care Leon, um, and this is from, ah, here's the name of it, the institute, the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety, IBHS, which is a really great resource with lots of very mind-boggling videos in a huge warehouse that they recreate fire in to see how fire spreads. Um, these, and Dr. Street, Steve Quarles, who actually is an ex-University of California resource who went to IBHS and is now back um, at, at UC, so I'm really excited to have him available to tap as a resource for us. Um, he established the following structural survival um, priorities based on their research for wildland fire. And as you can see, one and two are all about the house. So that just reinforces your start at the house and then work out. And then it gets into vegetation and defensible space and the stuff that we like to keep around our houses. Uh, and then moves back into more housing issues. But just to reinforce the point, uh, start with your house and work out. Here's that great poster uh, that we've got up in the back on home hardening from the Insurance Institute. Um, and then a wonderful um, graphic, um, Linda King and um, uh, Mary Lou, some of our later presenters are going to be doing a deeper dive with you on design considerations uh, and maintenance within uh, for a defensible space. Uh, and thank you to the papers for helping reinforce the importance of um, getting to know your neighbors. Um, for some of us, our neighbors are much closer than 100 feet of defensible space. Right? So we need to be thinking in, in bigger pictures of our, our neighbors' fire safe and, and does that make us fire safe. And there's lots of wonderful resources available through our firefighting community in that regard. And he also mentioned some wonderful community wildfire protection plans, also a really important resource to be developing and um, your local fire agency can help you in that regard. Okay, so um, 
uh, as part of our task force that put to, kind of did the deep dive into all the resources and put together materials. Um, surprisingly, um, one of the most important topics that surfaced we felt to educate on was red flag warning days. Um, so we've got a whole one-page handout that talks about um, being prepared on a red flag warning day. And um, I certainly was doing all my preparedness when we had a red flag, red flag warning day a couple of weeks ago. I had my bag packed and was ready to go. Um, but these are issued by the National Weather Service when conditions for a fire at the highest. Um, and the criteria involved um, con for consideration are sustained wind speeds, relative humidity, and 10 or a few moisture. Um, but we need, and I, I think it was Chief Akers who, who made reference to this as well, we need a new mindset, or maybe it was Susan, about disaster preparedness and, and being ready, not just for an earthquake, um, but for wildfire. Okay, I wanted to just briefly, briefly touch on um, a number of scientific studies um, by uh, our local UC Cooperative Extension Office as well as the University of California following the fires here in Sonoma County. Um, so I think it was week one of the fires, maybe week two, it all started to run together. Um, we started getting calls at our UC Cooperative Extension Office about whether the produce in people's backyard gardens was safe to eat. Um, and when we started um, uh, hooking up with food safety experts at the University of California on the topic, realized there is little to no research on this topic. Certainly, the scale of what happened in Sonoma County was unprecedented with the number of structures that were destroyed. Um, but that you know, raised a lot of questions about uh, what's in the air pollution and the ash from that. Uh, I started learning about things I never thought I'd learn about, like polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, um, heavy metals, dioxins, and furans. Um, but it, it showed us that there was a significant opportunity for some research post-fires to help answer those questions. So we launched a citizen science project um, in the weeks following the fire and um, uh, energized master gardeners to go out and take some produce samples in um, home gardens and community gardens and small farms around the county. And then we froze them at a lab in Berkeley and promptly started funding hunting, which it takes a long time. Um, uh, and we're actually, we just um, we got a, a $10,000 from UC Ag and Natural Resources to do some initial testing on those samples. Um, and then we um, just signed, cannot tell you how thrilled I am, it took months and months and months to get in place, an agreement with the Bay Area Air Quality Management District to study air pollution and the impact on produce safety and soil health. So we got them to include expanding it to soil health. So um, just this last summer, we um, did some additional soil sampling at the same sites that we did the produce sampling in uh, last October and November. And we hope to have results in the next couple of months to share with our community. So we have a web page set up on the UCCE Sonoma website. Uh, if you're interested in more information, we'll be posting that all there. And huge thank you to UCNR and, and the Air District for their funding in support of that. So there was actually um, an article in the Press Democrat this morning. We probably got you all out here so early this morning, you probably didn't have a chance to read it. And it was talking about a study um, at UC Davis about health impacts from the air pollution generated from the fires. Uh, look for that if you haven't seen it. But there's a number of other studies um, that were initiated or were either already underway or were initiated. Um, a study um, from UC Berkeley on chemical exposure of firefighters. <coughs> Uh, a very exciting study on the impact of toxicants on food animals, in this case specifically backyard chickens uh, through UC Davis, and Sonoma County sent in the most eggs of any county in California. <laughs> Pretty proud of that. Uh, we haven't seen any uh, results out of that as well. They got so many eggs. Um, they're a little inundated by the testing, I think. <laughs> Um, and one that I'm particularly excited about and have been anxiously awaiting the data for like 10 months, an ash and air quality study through UC Davis. There are actually some UC Davis researchers that came out and took ash samples and air samples in, um, around homes that burnt um, in the Tubbs fire. And I'm very excited to see what the results of their study will be. So um, here's that uh, web page I've been referencing. Um, uh, please visit our um, UC Master Gardener Program with Sonoma County webpage, and we have a, a dedicated Firewise Landscaping page set up now. It's got links to the four publications that you've all got copies of, 
um, as well as links to some um, phenomenal um, UC publications. Um, so um, this, this is a great publication on the home hardening topic, I would point you to. There's a great publication on home landscape <coughs> after fire. Uh, and then a great publication on combustibility of landscape mulches that was done in partnership with the University of Nevada at Reno. I also wanted to highlight um, the Sonoma Marine Water Saving Partnership, uh, which is uh, the collaborative of 10 utilities that serve the Sonoma and Marin counties. Um, and they um, launched a couple of initiatives post fires. Um, one in partnership with our Master Gardener program and a local um, nonprofit that's um, advocating for native plant habitat restoration. And we developed uh, two teams funded by the Water Agency and the City of Santa Rosa, developed a series of eight front yard landscape design templates that are based on sustainable and firewise landscaping principles. And we're going to implement those as demonstration gardens at the Santa Rosa Junior College campus. So that funding hunting thing, we're working on that for that as well. We applied for a grant to the Coastal Conservancy, um, and we're hoping to hear by December for funding on that so we can start getting some of those gardens started. But actually, the SRJC professors and their sustainability crew are really excited about the project and are already going to be launching some of the actual work on two of those demo gardens this fall, so we're really excited about them. And then the City of Santa Rosa and the Water <coughs> Agency also um, contracted with a local landscape architecture firm and a number of other partners and developed another set of eight landscape design front yard templates, it's a mouthful, um, that are pre-permitted um, through City of Santa Rosa. So you guys are probably all County of Sonoma, I would imagine. That might not apply to you, but uh, we have copies um, uh, here in the room if you're interested in seeing them. If you are rebuilding or looking to rehabilitate, lots of great ideas. They're demonstrating lots of different sustainable landscaping principles and um, Firewise uh, landscape design as well. So I just wanted to give a shout out, number one, to the wonderful Master Gardener team here in Sonoma, who have been working hard at work for the last few months to put this wonderful session together. Thank you all for that logistics. And to all the Master Gardeners who stepped up, including our four speakers today. Um, we all felt truly compelled to, um, to help share as much information as we could with our community. Um, and a special thanks to all the people who I stole slides from. <laughs> That's it. Thank you.